Welcome to Lecture 1. This is Dana Hogue. Lecture 1 is about policy and what it is, and this is the narrated version. You should find very little difference between this narrated version and the non-narrated version, uh, except I add a lot more examples in the narration. Let's move forward, shall we? Let's start with this question. What do you think policy is? That may sound like a really easy question, but the reason I ask is a lot of people who take my class think I mean politics, for example, uh, or other things that sound kind of boring and argumentative, and, and that's really not what policy is about. So let's start by giving you a healthy idea of what I mean. Can policy apply to government only, or, or can it apply somewhere else too, like say CSU? Well, of course it can apply to CSU. CSU has all kinds of policies. Policies about how you can get grades, how you can dispute grades, uh, even policies about carrying a gun on campus. It has lots of policies. Um, associations like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association or the Corn Growers Association or any association is going to have their policies. Um, Groups like Sierra Club are going to have policies. Your employer has policies. Even your mom and dad might have had policies, like um, what time you had to be home if you went on a date. So when we talk about policies, I want to I want to focus on government because government is the foundation of policies. It's the it's the big daddy, so to speak. If you understand government policies, you'll certainly understand that policies about your employer. Before I go to the next slide, I want you to write down a one sentence definition of what you think policy means. Please pause right now and hit play again when you think you have your sentence written. My definition of policy is a plan or a guiding principle implemented by an entity, say the government, that is chosen from a set of alternatives to achieve a goal. Now, I'm not usually big on definitions, but in this case, I am pretty big on this definition because it helps us understand where policies can be really ineffective. If you notice, I have three major things that I want to, three major traits that I want to focus on, and I'm going to focus on these all semester. First of all, it has to have a plan. Second of all, it has to have an entity. And third, it has to have a goal. The plan is, you, you know, you, you can't have a goal like I want to go to uh, Ohio without a plan that says, here's the way we're going to go. And you have to have an entity, a way to make that plan work, like a car. So uh, you have to have all three of these ingredients. Now, many policies don't have all three of these ingredients, which is why I mention it. Let's take an example. How about Social Security? Social Security certainly has a plan. It tells you how much you can get, how old you have to be to get it, uh, even you know the, the date the checks are going to be mailed, a very rigorous plan. It has an entity, the government, who really controls this program. There's no arguing with them. So in that sense, it's a very good policy. However, I really dispute that anybody really knows what the goal of Social Security is. Do you? Perhaps you think you have an answer. You know what Social Security is, but if I ask you to give me that answer and then defend it, how would you defend it? How do you know that's what the goal of Social Security is? Have you heard somebody articulate that Congress has decided this is what the goal is? One argument could be the goal should be what it was when they made Social Security in the 1930s. Uh, of course, back then there were a lot of people who didn't have retirement plans and the primary thing was to ensure there's a retirement plan. But since not very many people had it, they pretty made much made Social Security for everyone. Now, I would argue, Many people have their own retirement plans and don't need Social Security, or they're rich and don't need Social Security. So personally, I don't think the goal ought to be the same as it was in 1930. In my own view, I think it ought to be a safety net program. 
a program like an insurance program where we pay less in each because only some of us are going to need it. So, for example, if 30 people started the same job the same year and worked till they were 70, maybe 10 of those people wouldn't have made it because they got ill or they made stupid decisions or had bad luck. And if that's the case, and we know that 10 out of 30 are going to need the insurance, or one-third of the people would need the insurance, then, of course, we all have to chip in less to have enough money for those 10 people. Now, we all would chip in because, like any insurance, we chip in because we don't know if it's going to be us that's going to have the car wreck or somebody else. But if it's us, we collect, and if it isn't, somebody else collects. That's how I think insurance ought to be, or Social Security ought to be. But the Association of, of a Retired Persons, ARP, would totally disagree with me. They would say, I paid in every year or every month, therefore it's my money. Nobody can prove who's right or wrong because leadership has not gone out and made sure we have a common goal. So my point would be this. How can we talk about a plan for Social Security to save it when we don't even agree as a society about what the goal ought to be? How about you? Can you think of policies that maybe have two of these elements but not a third? I mean, some policies have a goal like policies to end racism, for example, but they don't have a very good plan. Or maybe drug enforcement is another program that's got a lot of problems. Think about that a little bit as I move on. Let's talk about the policy recipe. Print the handout that I provided on RAMCT because we'll refer to it a lot this semester. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but for now, notice that there are three traits of the policy that I just mentioned appear on the far left of the policy recipe in a circle. We will go through each of these carefully the next few sections. We will look at the goals this week and the other two traits next week. In other words, we'll look at goals this week and the plan and the entity next week. So we will go through that recipe. And in a few minutes, I will talk about that policy recipe in more detail. But before moving on, let's ask why it's important to have all three traits. I've already articulated that the answer is that one of the two traits makes it is that one or two traits makes for ineffective or even silly laws. What good is a law that is not enforced or a law that the goal, that has a goal but no plan or a plan with no goal? Now I want you to do a little homework. I want you to find two laws that have two traits, but not, a th but not three, and post them to the discussion site this week. Write a short comment on which trait is missing and why this makes the law less meaningful. You don't need to write anything very long. Try, to find, try looking at websites that specialize in silly or dumb laws. If you Google silly laws or dumb laws, you'll get these really funny websites. Look at, then what I want you to do is I want you to look at other people's postings as they come online too. And feel free to comment on other people's postings. I'll be watching too and this will be part of your participation grade. Let's move on now to the policy recipe. I have taken, I've made a drawing that pretty much summarizes the entire class. This drawing also matches the outline that you'll find on RAM CT. The outline, if we go through it, will go through the graph, and that's pretty much what I expect you to know all semester. So, in a sense, this graph is what I want you to know all semester. Periodically check back and forth between the graph and the outline, and you'll do well on the test. Now, let's kind of walk through this this um, policy recipe, okay? There are three parts. Graph, 
And that's pretty much what I expect you to know all semester. So in a sense, this graph is what I want you to know all semester. Periodically check back and forth between the graph and the outline, and you'll do well on the test. Now let's kind of walk through this. This, this um, policy recipe, okay? There are three parts. You notice there's a top circle, and that's what maybe the way a scientist might think. In our case, this will be uh, the science of economics, well, mostly, but you don't have to really think about it that way. Think about this. If, if I were to walk up to an animal nutritionist and ask them about a policy that affected animal nutrition, the way they would probably go about answering that policy, like um, uh, let's say we had a law that no antibiotics could be used on beef that was going to be fed to pets. Um, you as a nutritionist would probably try to answer that question in a very scientific way. You'd probably try to tell me about how many pets ingest um, antibiotics and and uh, how that affects the environment or how that affects pets uh, health or how that affects human health. But you think about it like a scientist. So that's the top box or that top circle I mean. The second thing is um, you'll notice that there is a bottom box and I call this the minefield as you can see. The reason is that no matter how long you work on a policy, say you work on a policy for two years and, and uh, it, it's all science, sooner or later you have to walk out the door and you have to tell people about your policy and hope they accept it. Now the reason I put a minefield is that um, as you walk through that door and you want to get success. So you think about it this way. You have a report in hand and you think you've got a good idea and you walk out that door and you want to get success. In other words, let's just say Congress voting in your bill. You walk through and there's a landmine or a minefield there with, with landmines in it that can really blow you up. They can stop you. And maybe they're not fair, but they can stop you. Now notice that I put three minds in here. The first is participants. So suppose you um, work on a policy a long time and you walk out the door and the first thing you do is you run into a participant group that doesn't like what you're doing. Suppose uh, you're working on rights, rights of dying or something like that and you run into a participant group that doesn't believe that um, people should be able to take their own lives. Those are participant groups. That's a landmine. You could have your whole program blow up because you run into a participant group that's effectively able to stop you. Let's say you get past that landmine and you go to the next one. The next one is authorization to enforcement. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand that even if you get everybody to agree with you, or many people to agree with you, and a few don't, you can run into problems with the way you what you want to get done, the process and in, in what you want to get done gets handled. Maybe you go to Congress and you get them to authorize a bill that 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 goes your way. But then somebody else who doesn't want that bill to work out understands the process well enough that makes sure it never gets funded. They get on the funding committee and make sure nothing happens. Health care could work that way. There's, there's a lot of talk about Republicans trying to undo the health care program that, that Obama and the Democrats put in last session. A lot of people argue that there's not, because the Republicans only control the House, that they can't do anything about that. However, one thing they could do is maybe they could see that certain things aren't funded. And if there's no funding to manage things, then of course it's harder to do things. So something can get killed, in other words, your whole program can get blown up because somebody understands the process well enough to throw a roadblock in your way. The third one is economic, political, and social feasibility. Maybe something is 
economically a good idea and socially acceptable but not politically acceptable or maybe it's economically acceptable and politically feasible but not socially acceptable one could argue health care was economically feasible because we can do it and was politically feasible because the democrats controlled the house the senate and the presidency so they were able to do it but it wasn't socially feasible because that's because the rest of the country didn't happen to agree with them, or a lot of people didn't, enough people didn't. And that's why uh, they lost the House. Uh, you could argue, for example, when President Bush fought stem cell research, that, or, sorry, funding from the federal government for stem cell research, that it was economically feasible and politically feasible, but wasn't socially feasible. You could argue that Gay marriage, for example, is economically feasible and socially feasible as the percentage of people that approve of gay marriage or aren't bothered by it goes up, but isn't politically feasible because there's still enough people that would fight it politically that it would be hard to pass. At any rate, imagine again that you're done with your scientific analysis and the next part of policy process is you have to get through this minefield. It's not about whether you're right or wrong. It's about having to get through these big hurdles. That's why the third part of the policy recipe is indicated by that, that orange um, bracket shows the strategies that you might use to get through the, the minefield. If you walked out of a door metaphorically with your report in hand and you saw a minefield metaphorically sitting in front of you, you would have to get a strategy. How am I going to get to the other side? You might use, if it was a real minefield, you'd use some sort of device that detects mines and you'd work your way through the minefield. In this case, I've given you three different ways to approaches that you can work your way through a minefield. Um, you'd do the same thing. You would look ahead and instead of looking for landmines, you'd look for participant groups that might really want to stop you. And you'd ask yourself before you went into that landmine field, how do I how do I work with those participants? How do I get around them or how do I change their minds or how do I stop them from being effective? Just like any other just like planning for a landmine. Now the three approaches that I've given you are ethnocentric or altruistic, which essentially means, for example, if you run into the participant that is against you, you make an argument to that person that uh, they should be altruistic and let you through because they should care about your cause and you try to convince them that your cause is a good enough cause that they should allow it even though they maybe don't care for it. A second approach is a social contract approach and in that approach you try to convince the participant that they're actually better off with this program even though they may not have thought so. And if they allow the program to go forward, it's like a contract. You let me do my program and I will give you something in return. Now the third one is called public choice or political economy. And in that sense, what happens is if I run into a participant that disagrees with me and I can't convince them that it's altruistic or that there's a good social contract, then maybe what I'll do is just I'll just overpower that person. The public choice or political economy route says let's not worry about what's right and wrong. Let's just understand the political system and the way to manipulate public and so forth well enough that I can work around that person, club them and get them out of my way. Now let's talk a little bit more about each of these circles and again don't worry if you're not following everything right now because when we get done, uh, sorry, as we move through the semester, we're going to be talking about each of these in detail. Let's start with the circle. The circle in the policy recipe on the far left has my three uh, parts of def the definition of a, of a good policy, a goal, a plan, and an entity. And again, we're going to go through each one of those as we go through the semester. Let's start with goal. Notice as I 
move from goal to efficiency and equity. These are the official, so to speak, um, objects or goals that society should be interested in. Equity or efficiency. Now, I'll talk about why that is later, but let's just leave that for now as is. Now, notice between equity and efficiency, I have the word filter written. The reason I have the word filter written is that even if you agree that equity and efficiency should be the goals of society, we're never going to agree, all of us, about what those ought to be. There's a filter, if you will, that makes you and I each see equity differently. Um, for example, how you were raised, whether you're a girl or whether you're a boy, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, whether you're from the south or the north, all those sorts of things filter your view of what you think is fair or even efficient. So we'll talk about those value filters, um, but the, the key thing that makes this really interesting is that society, when it sets goals, has a really hard time because we can't even agree on what's fair. We'll talk about how to handle that later. Now, that's, that's goal. If I take entity, we're talking about the government. Notice as I move from out on this axis for entity that it goes through market failure and government failure. The idea of the entity is that we have to ask the question, do we really want government making decisions for us? Or do we want the market to make the decisions? For example, do we want health care to be a market decision or, or a government decision? Or maybe a little of both. We're going to talk about that, and basically it comes down to this. If the market is failing to do its job, maybe we want the government involved. If the government's involved and it fails to do its job, maybe we want the market to do it. So if whatever is going on is run by the market and the market has a lot of market failure, we may move toward government. If the government is currently running it and there's a lot of government failure, we may move toward market. We'll talk about that again in more detail at a later time. Let's talk about the last one, which is tools. So if we have a goal, like let's say our goal is to feed the poor, and we have an entity, the, the, the government, and the government's going to feed the poor, and then we have, we have to have a plan. How are they going to do that? The plan is going to have a set of tools, which I don't list any here, but we'll discuss tools like taxes, regulations, subsidies, and so forth. Now, I'm not going to talk about the second parts of the policy recipe at this point. We're going to start on this half of the policy recipe for the first part of the semester. So moving forward, the first thing we're going to talk about is how to set goals. Again, there are really two goals to consider, equity and efficiency. Efficiency just simply means, think of it as the size of the economic pie. More efficiency means more pie for everyone. Now, economics might sound like too narrow a definition for you, so let me put it this way. In your life, you have a happiness pie, for example, everything that makes you happy. Some of that's money, some of that's relationships with your friends, your house, your neighborhood, whatever that is. But you have a, a, a welfare pie, we'll call it. If I am able to increase that welfare pie, in other words, make you happier by, say, 10%, with some input that is very cheap, then I have increased efficiency. So, for example, if I could uh, discover an energy source that was a penny a year to run, the efficiency of the country would increase tremendously because it would cost very little and it would gain a lot. That's what efficiency means. So think of it as the economic pie growing. Equity refers to the division of the pie. How big is my piece compared to yours? So 
Suppose the country grows and we get a bigger economic pie. What if only the rich people get any slices and the poor people don't? That might not be a good thing. Um, at least a lot of people would think of that as, as not such a good thing. So equity is really asking the question, uh, is the economic pie divided fairly? Now, you might ask the question, why do we make everything about equity and efficiency? The answer is to be objective. If I asked you what should the goals of policy be, anybody in this class could have given me an answer right away. But we need some sort of objective way that's consistent across all of us. So let's try a really weird example to see, to, to make my point, okay? Let's, let's talk about the death penalty. Suppose somebody asked you, do you think the death penalty is fair or should we have it? And they put you on a committee and it was your job to decide whether the death penalty was, was fair. If that's the case, if we use our equity and efficiency rules, we can come up with a better answer than just going from our gut. Of course, if I asked this question, people would start making all sorts of arguments like, you know, hey, this guy killed somebody, he ought to be killed, or no, we're a society that shouldn't take anyone's life because we're civilized, or all sorts of answers that really come from the heart. We have to figure out a way to organize those. So think of two efficiency and think of two equity reasons that could be argued to support or end, it doesn't matter, the death penalty in the United States. I'll tell you some on the next page, but don't go there until you think about it first. So what I want you to do is pause right now and write down two efficiency and two equity reasons. Because I think that please do this, to take the time to do it, don't just forward. Because I think you'll see it's a little, thinking about it forces you to learn what I mean by equity and what I mean by efficiency. I'll wait while you pause, and I'll welcome you back in a minute. Welcome back. If we say the death penalty is a deterrent to murder, for example, if, in other words, if we have the death penalty, less people will do murder, we could all spend less time on our own protection. Think about all the waste that would be created if we had to protect ourselves from killers. We would buy guns, we'd put bars on our windows, we'd travel less, etc., which all of which would drag down the economy. So again, suppose anybody, you know, there was a lot more murders going on because we didn't do anything about murder. And I know that's not the case, but let's just take that extreme. Then the economy would just be dragged down because of all the waste it would create. That means efficiency is one argument for the death penalty. 
Now, I realize some people argue that the death penalty really isn't a deterrent to uh, murder, but um, we're not going to debate that right now. Suppose it were, then that would be an argument for it meant for efficiency. From an equity standpoint, an economist might look at the economic cost of murder on all citizens. Perhaps more murders hurt the poor more than they hurt the rich. So from an equity standpoint, you might say, well, I'm um, pro-death penalty because um, murders happen more to poor people than they do rich people, and we really need to help protect them because they're the ones that are hurt most by this. Of course, you could turn that around and say most people convicted of murder happen to be poor people, so maybe we shouldn't have the death penalty. Those are equity arguments. The point is that policy, as policy scientists, we need to be as rigorous as we can. Other information is relevant, of course, but it is supplemental to the analysis that our science can provide. Let's talk about efficiency now. As I mentioned before, Efficiency is about the size of the economic pie. Think of this pie as social welfare. It's, it is the value of all things we value. And of course, you, your pie is going to be different than my pie. And by definition, then, if there are things you value, more pie is always better. We define efficiency simply as output over input. That is output per unit of input. For example, if we look at corn yields, Corn yields are 250% higher now than they were 50 years ago. So a field that 50 years ago yielded 100 bushels per acre, that would be 100 for output and 1 for input, would now yield 250 bushels, that's 250 for output and 1 per input. Thus, efficiency went up from 100 to 250%. So it went up by 150%. Now, it's important to see here that efficiency can be increased by making inputs more efficient or by making output more efficient. So, for example, um, breeding corn that grows faster is on the output side. But learning how to apply methods that apply fertilizer more effectively are on the input side. So if I reduce the input needed to get a certain output, that increases efficiency. Or if I reduce the output for any given amount of input, that increases efficiency. We've had a tremendous success with this in America and uh, in, in American agriculture. <coughs> now, efficiency can be measured in many different units, like money, energy, physical, etc. Economists claim to be better at efficiency than equity because equity involves so many value judgments. In other words, if, if I were to say, you know, whether something's fair or not, there's so many different ways to value that. Economists really don't have a corner on the market. Whereas maybe efficiency seems like a very technical thing. In other words, I can simply say, yes, I know there are 250 bushels per acre now, and there used to be 150, so that's purely efficiency. And that's something I'm good at, and it's not about equity, so economists feel they do better at efficiency. But that isn't really true, because efficiency itself is a value judgment. So economists cannot stay fully neutral, and neither can you. And one of the things I want you to understand in this class is that we're all biased. And we try not to put our biases in our analysis, if we could help it, but we are all biased. Me, as an economist, uh, simply makes me biased because I believe that efficiency is a good thing. If I make a, a cow produce twice as much milk as it did 10 years ago, I've done a good thing. Um, I might look at uh, somebody else that looks at animal welfare might say that that's a totally biased way to look at it because what we should be looking at is are we treating animals better in 10 years than we were today and doubling their production probably isn't doing 
doing us any favors in terms of making animals better off. Um, for example, would it be biased for me to say that we are better off in America today than ever before we, because we have more wealth per person? Well, the answer is yes, because not everyone will agree that wealth is a good thing, and even those that do will not agree how to measure it. So, for example, some people can say, yeah, we're more wealthy, but there's a, a bigger gap between wealthy and poor, so we're not better off. Or somebody else might say, we're more wealthy, but we don't talk to our neighbors on their front porches anymore, and we play too much Nintendo, or Wii, or, or uh, we don't spend enough time talking to each other, or we're, we're, we don't, we're being, becoming obese because we don't spend enough time outside. So it's really hard to, to say that efficiency is not heavily tied or closely tied to equity. So, keep these separate, equity and efficiency, but just understand that they are tied together as well. Sometimes, for example, we might make something less efficient on purpose because it makes something else more equitable. For example, when we said that small children can't work in mines any longer, that hurt productivity, but it sure made us a lot more efficient. Let's talk a little more about equity. The way our economic pie is divided matters as much as how big it is. We don't want one person getting uh, too big a slice while somebody else only gets a sliver. But let's talk about the kinds of equity there are. There's two kinds. One is spatial, that's across space, and the other is temporal, that's across time. So when you think about it, um, well, let's define them first. Spatial refers to division across space. How are benefits of the policy divided across states, across gender, across ethnicity or age groups, etc.? Temporal refers to division of pi across time. How is wealth divided over time? People that argue for sus sustainability, for example, are concerned that this generation is getting more than their fair share of the planet's bounty. So basically, when you're making a policy, you have to be concerned about whether it's equity, what equitable. And there are a lot of ways to ask that question. Again, if you say the federal government does a policy and everybody in America on the East Coast benefited, everybody on the West Coast didn't, you might argue that's not very fair across space. Or if old people gained and young people didn't, you might argue that it's not fair. The temporal one, again, is like we have to make sure that we don't ruin the planet for the next generation. So, for example, if I was the type of person that wanted as much as I could get out of my lifetime, and I, I, I could say, well, I'm going to go ahead and ruin my land or I ruin the environment, it doesn't really matter as long as, you know, I'm going to just use it up so that when I die I had a much better life than if I didn't use it up, people would argue that wouldn't be fair to the next generation. So equity can be divided again into these two different categories. Let's take an example, though, because equity is kind of tricky. I mean, it's, it's a word that isn't exactly obvious what it means. So here's a little example. Below is some real data on how income is distributed in the United States. Now, Notice the lowest 20% get 5% of the income and the highest 20% get 45% of the income. If I were to graph this, you can see by the red pen that I'm going to, by the blue line, the blue line would be perfect equality. So for example, if I draw a point from, let's just do it 60%, if I draw from 60% uh, to the blue line and then down, it would mean 60% of the population get 60% of the income. If I draw any other line, like from say 20, 20% 20 of the population get 20% of the income. That would be perfectly equal distribution of money. But I've graphed the previous chart and it follows this kind of curved yellow line here. 
and you can see that the first 5% of the population, or sorry, 20% of the population only get about 5% of the income. The next 20% get another, say, 15% of the income on top of that. And the next 20% get a, another, say, 20% of income on top of that. So 60% of the people, 60% only get around 30% of the income. If I go up to 80%, 80% of the people only get around 55% of the income. And the remaining 20% get the rest. So 20% get, this 20% get 45% of the income. And the 80%, the rest of us, the 80, only get 55% of the income. Now this certainly isn't equal, but my question to you, is it equitable? This is tricky because, you know, I, I might think it's perfectly fair and you might think it's perfectly unfair. Now, before I move on with that, it's perfectly okay to disagree in policy. That's what makes policy interesting is we're a nation of people who have different opinions. And, of course, only one opinion may prevail in policy, but all opinions get to get considered. So in this case, um, what would you think? Do you think this is equitable? It's not equal, but is it equitable? Is it okay that, you know, 20% of the people make 45% of the income and 80 only make 55% of the income? Is that okay? One argument would be, sure, the 80% or sorry, the 20% worked harder, and people that work harder ought to get more money. A counter argument to that would be, no, people that worked harder uh, shouldn't get more money. Everybody should get the same amount. Or another counter argument to that would be, no, the people with the most money didn't work harder. They were born with it, or the laws of this country favor the rich and people that make the lower incomes were born to poor parents who couldn't afford college and things like that. Now probably all of those are a little bit true. Maybe um, maybe people who make more money do deserve to make more money for the most part, but some don't. And maybe those that don't make much money maybe should be making less because they don't work as hard or they're not as smart or whatever. But a lot of them really didn't have the chance to, to, to make more money either. So whether this is equitable or not, the, the income distribution in America is debatable. Let's move on. We can say that there are at least three reasons that people don't agree about what is and what is not equitable. Now, I'm using these words, facts, values, and beliefs, in a different way than you're used to. So please be careful that you understand that. The three reasons that, these, these are the things that go in that value filter, by the way. The reason I might think differently than you come down to these three things. The first is facts. Some people just don't have the facts. So for example, if you and I have different uh, goals about, or different perceptions about what's equitable or efficient, it may just be that you have a lot of facts and I don't. My facts are just all wrong. I might think, for example, that uh, a program um, unjustly affects the, the poor, and you might explain to me that I had it all wrong. And that happens a lot. And in fact, that's probably the approach most people try to use when somebody doesn't agree with them, is you approach them and you say, hey, I have the facts and you don't, and let me explain the facts to you, and then of course you'll think just like me. This is one of my pet peeves. That's a good approach to start with, but don't assume that people that don't think like you don't have the facts. Many of the time is the time that I've approached somebody that didn't think the way I did, and I simply dismissed them as not having the facts, and I learned quickly when I tried to argue with them that they had the facts plenty, uh, maybe as better than I did. 
So the first step is a good one to start by asking whether your facts differ, but be aware that maybe people have the facts just as well as you do. The second one is beliefs. Um, some people believe that, in, in this case, I don't mean beliefs like religious beliefs. Uh, I mean a belief is that I believe something to be true. So some people have a belief about the facts, but they are not correct or, 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 or corroborated. So for example, I might say I believe in the death penalty ought to be uh, applied because it's too expensive to keep people in prison. That's a belief that I'm stating as a fact. Well, it may be, but it turns out that it actually costs more to uh, keep to, to, to execute someone than it does to keep them in prison because of all the appeals that they get. So that person's belief about a fact is not true. So when I say beliefs, I mean that something that people think is a fact that really isn't a fact. The third one is values. So let's Let's say you and I have a discussion and we get the beliefs and facts straightened out and we're, we both now understand the facts, then we should agree, right? Wrong. Maybe I still will believe that there should be a different solution than you. This is where values come down. People have different values. I might think it's fair that harder workers get more money than slackers, but you might think everyone should earn the same thing. So this comes down to your value system. And so again, you and I, or maybe we would have a discussion about, um, well, let's take the health care, for example, whether everybody deserves the same health care. I might believe that people that don't work as hard, don't have as much money, deserve health care, but not as good a health care as I deserve. And you might believe, no, that's not fair. Everybody deserves the same health care as everybody else. Um, in Canada, for example, where health care is public, if you don't like the, 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 basically everybody should be getting the same treatment. But if you don't like the treatment you're getting, you can pop across the border and pay somebody in America, and if you have the money, and you can get treatment. Um, Sweden actually has a law, they have public health care, they actually have a law that it's against the law to go to another country and seek health care. So for example, if I needed um, you know, a kidney and they told me I was going to have to wait uh, six months because it's a public health care system and I knew I could get a kidney in a month if I just flew over to England or, or to America, uh, it's actually against the law because that country's value system is that even if you're rich and have the money, you shouldn't have better health care than somebody poor. So they've actually passed the law to keep people from doing that. So what's interesting is the values are going to be different. And we live in a country where everybody, everybody's values count, no matter how crazy they may seem. But only one set of values usually prevails. So again, we're going to set goals, equity and efficiency. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have to convince everybody what we think those ought to be. And of course, that's going to involve presenting facts, trying to get rid of beliefs that aren't true, and then of course, considering all the value systems and trying to come up with something that we can all live with. Well, that's the end of this. So we've gone through now the goals section. We, we've, we've, I'm sorry, we've defined the policy recipe and we've done the goals section. We'll pick up next time on the other parts of the definition, the entity, uh, for example. We'll see you next time. Thank you.